Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about another hyperkinetic movement disorder called hemibolismus. Now, hemibolismus is a secondary condition that's really caused by anything that causes damage to the sub thalamic nucleus, which remember is a component of the basal nuclei. So you can see the basal nuclei right here. This long tail will be the caudate nucleus. This is the putamen. Purple, we have the globus pallidus, right? Thalamus is in red back here. And beneath the thalamus, we have this yellow structure where my mouse is, and that's the subthalamic nucleus. And hemibolismus is caused by damage to the subthalamic nucleus. Now, jumping down here real quick. Uh, when you have damage to the subthalamic nuclei, this causes violent involuntary limb movements. However, hemibolismus differs from Huntington's disease that we talked about before in several important ways. One of those is that hemibolismus results as a secondary condition to something else. So with Huntington's disease, that was the primary condition. So the mechanism of Huntington's disease most likely is a prion disorder, and you get progressive destruction of specific cells, and that is Huntington's disease. Hemibolismus is normally caused by something else. So for example, the most common cause of hemibolismus is a stroke. And we know that strokes can occur anywhere in the brain, right? Uh, but if that stroke manages to damage the subthalamic nucleus, then you're going to see hemibolismus, and that's the most common cause of this. Uh, you can also have it as a result of traumatic brain injury, so if you get hit in the head really hard, like in a motor vehicle accident, if it damages the subthalamic nucleus, you can see hemibolismus in addition to other things. Uh, also, ALS. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis really just kind of randomly damages areas of the nervous system. And if it happens to damage the subthalamic nucleus, you get hemibolismus. And so if you have any one of these conditions and it happens to damage this structure, you will potentially have hemibolismus, okay? among other things that you would see in those conditions. So that's the first way that hemibolismus differs from Huntington's disease. The other ways that it differs has to do with the exact presentation. Now remember how I said that hemibolismus, we have damage to the subthalamic nuclei and this causes violent involuntary limb movements. Now with Huntington's disease, we see those movements on both sides of the body. So Huntington's is bilateral. Also Huntington's tends to affect more of the distal limbs or distal musculature. In contrast, hemibolismus only is gonna affect one side of the body. So it's gonna be unilateral and it also tends to affect the proximal muscles rather than distal. So proximal and unilateral in hemibolismus. So let's actually watch this video real quick. So let's actually watch this video. And you'll obviously notice quickly that it's his right lower extremity that's mostly affected. Now, occasionally you'll see his leg kick out. That's some quadriceps action right there. But most of the movement you can kind of see is really at the hip girdle. He's getting a lot of abduction and adduction, and even more internal and external rotation. Those movements are caused by proximal musculature at that right hip. And so you can see that the left leg is not really affected at all. Right? It's just the right leg that's affected, and it's really those proximal muscles that are rapidly and involuntarily inducing external and internal rotation, and a little bit of adduction and abduction. Here's our brief review of the direct and indirect pathways for the basal nuclei. Remember that the direct pathway, which is shown here, is responsible for promoting muscle contraction and promoting movement, whereas the indirect pathway is for inhibiting muscle contraction and inhibiting movement. Now, in order to promote movement and muscle contraction, specific nuclei of the thalamus have to be activated. So the more activity we have of the thalamus, the more muscle contraction we're going to have and the more movement associated with a particular region. Then down here we have a couple clusters of cell bodies. Right here we have the globus pallidus internus and then a region of the substantia nigra called pars reticulata. When you see these regions that are in gray boxes, that denotes that they are inhibitory. So when activated, the globus pallidus internus will act to inhibit the thalamus. And so when there's more activity of the globus pallidus internus, 
there's less activity of the thalamus and less movement. Or the opposite's also true. If we have less activity of the globus pallidus internus, then it's not able to inhibit the thalamus, and so we have more activity of the thalamus and more movement. Now up here we have the striatum, which is composed of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. This is also inhibitory, and this region of the striatum will actually act to inhibit the globus pallidus internus and, of course, the substantia nigra PR. And so if the striatum is inhibiting the globus pallidus internus, then this structure is no longer able to inhibit the thalamus. And so you have two inhibitions in a row, that's called disinhibition, and so the thalamus will have net activation and you'll have more movement. Okay? So the direct pathway is going to result in increased muscle contraction and increased movement. The indirect pathway has the opposite effect. So the striatum is still inhibitory here, and the globus pallidus internus is still inhibitory on the thalamus. However, in this case, a portion of the striatum is sending inhibitory neurons to the globus pallidus externus. Now, normally the globus pallidus externus is inhibitory, and when it's active, it will act to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. And so in this case, the striatum is inhibiting the globus pallidus externus, and so the globus pallidus externus is no longer able to inhibit the subthalamic nucleus. Okay? So we're inhibiting inhibition, leading to net activation of the subthalamic nucleus. So this is activated, and its job is to then activate the globus pallidus internus. Well, remember how we said when there's less activity of this, there's more movement? Well, now we're activating the globus pallidus internus, and so when there's more activity here, there's actually less movement because the globus pallidus internus will be inhibiting these nuclei of the thalamus, and that leads to less movement, less muscle contraction, and so on and so forth. So direct pathway is more movement, more muscle contraction. Indirect pathway is inhibiting movement, inhibiting muscle contraction. So here's what the basal nuclei look like in the case of hemibolismus. Now remember that the structure that's damaged is the subthalamic nucleus, and this is only a component of the indirect pathway. That means that the direct pathway is not affected in hemibolismus. So remember that if we want to get movement normally, we have to have increased activity of the thalamus, right? And we achieve that by inhibiting the globus pallidus internus. Remember that if the globus pallidus internus and the substantia nigra PR, if these are less active, we get more movement because their job when active is to inhibit the thalamus, but if they are inhibited, then they cannot inhibit the thalamus and the thalamus by definition is active. And so the direct pathway just does what it normally does. The direct pathway will activate movement and you get muscle contraction and movement. Now let's take a look at the indirect pathway. This is what's affected. So the striatum can still inhibit the globus pallidus externus, and the globus pallidus externus can still technically inhibit the subthalamic nucleus, but all this up here doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter what the striatum's doing. It doesn't matter what the globus pallidus externus is doing. If the subthalamic nucleus has been substantially damaged, it can't function regardless of what the globus pallidus externus is telling it to do. Now, what would the job of the subthalamic nucleus normally be? Well, it would normally be to activate the globus pallidus internus, and what that would do is suppress unwanted movement. Remember, if the globus pallidus internus is more active, then we get less movement. That helps to suppress unwanted movement. That's the job of the indirect pathway. But if the subthalamic nucleus is damaged, it's not going to be able to activate the globus pallidus internus. So the globus pallidus internus and the substantia nigra PR are going to be less active, especially because they're influenced by the direct pathway. So we have less activity of the globus pallidus internus and therefore too much activity of the thalamus. We're not able to suppress unwanted movements. And that's due to the significant damage here to that subthalamic nucleus. And the resulting failure to suppress unwanted movements is why we see those characteristic violent and voluntary limb movements on one side of the body that we saw in this video right here. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of hemibolismus and also how it differs from the other hyperkinetic movement disorder, Huntington's disease. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.